it's really cold, which is probably appropriate because we are about to drive a Swedish piece of metal. This is the Volvo C40 Recharge. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I'm Kate Walton Elliott. And let's get inside because it's blinking cold. this now for about a week yep. and we've been driving it and one of the things that I'm very surprised about is how Volvo it feels. Yeah I mean from the very moment from the outside it looks Volvo you get in and it feels Volvo and you start driving and it has that kind of certainty about where it's going. It's it's very sure-footed which it's is a very dreamy. Volvo thing you can modify the steering. You can have it light or you can have it firm, I think is the, is the setting. And interestingly, our cameraman Michael, when he was driving it, he had it turned off and had it in a very light steering, which is unlike Michael. I prefer it in the setting it is now where it gives you a bit of heft. Yes, and I tried both. I definitely found that the firm one was more to my taste. I do feel like there's not an enormous amount of road feel, but to be honest, I don't expect an enormous amount of road feel out of a Volvo. I was surprised to see how responsive the steering is, especially in the lighter steering mode. Yeah. Parking and manoeuvring in cities is a dream. It is, it is. It's really very good at controlling the way that it feels. And it, it does do a really excellent job as a larger city car, although this is by no means a large car, but. Well, it depends which side of the Atlantic you're on, right? So in Europe, this would be, I guess, a C segment? Yes, I would think so. But over here, it, it it's more geared towards a subcompact feel. Obviously, there are multiple vehicles based on this platform. This is the CMA platform and there are many different vehicles built on that platform. Because Volvo is a fairly small volume automaker, at least on a global scale, it doesn't have a huge amount of resources to spend on making its own platform. And so it has worked with other groups in the Geely family to develop the CMA platform, Compact Modular Architecture Platform. And that, that platform is not designed as an electric vehicle platform. Although I should note, the majority of, of vehicles produced by Geely family brands are electric, built on this. So this shares the same platform with the Polestar 2. It shares the same platform with the, the Zika 001, I believe, is built on it and a whole slew of other Chinese brands that you probably never heard of and I'd never heard of until I was researching the CMA platform. So there's definitely a lot of engineering that has gone into making this chassis and this powertrain behave in a particular way. And there is an element of the Polestar 2 when you are behind the wheel. It has that same kind of feel. It's definitely got the Polestar oomph, you know, this is the, the twin motor variant, and it really shifts when it wants to. Zero to 60 in, what, four-ish seconds? I think it's about four and a half. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think the, the CMA platform that they've used underlying this, it is a little bit long in the tooth, which is probably part of the reason that you have the massive transmission tunnel, which is filled with batteries. Yes. Um, and yet it is also an extremely flexible platform. There's a lot about it that can be tweaked, which is why you can have a smallish car like this built on the same platform as the Polestars. And really, I think that it being Volvo, 
they don't have the money to do something entirely new. But this is a really competent addition to the electric vehicle range that they have. The suspension doesn't jerk and doesn't bounce around? No, it handles its weight really incredibly well. It just feels, it, it's maybe a little tiny bit harsh in cities, but out on the road like this, it's just really well tuned. I think though also that there's an element here and, and I'm, I'm just thinking about this this morning as I was getting ready to film this. Volvo in North America is a very different brand to Volvo in Europe. In Europe, Volvo is, is, is viewed by many as a, a go-to brand, a, a Northern European reliable, safe brand. Over here, Volvo is something more of a niche. It's more of a, I don't want a BMW or an Audi. I don't want a Mercedes Benz. I want something that's maybe a little more understated. I want the safety aspects of it. And maybe I have this fond memory of the 240 and 740 wagons that, you know, ran around when I was a kid in the, in the seventies and the eighties. This is marketed much more in, in North America, I think as a middle-aged person's car and I think that shows in the way that the cabin is laid out in the way that the car drives it's that very predictable no-nonsense feel that actually is a really good point my wife got in the car and her first comment was oh blue carpets yes and I think that that with the blue carpet feel in the door sides and it just it does feel a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit retro perhaps, but at the same time it's very pleasant and it really gets that kind of nostalgic feel. I feel like I'm sat in my 340. Yes, yes. And, and there are elements of my old 240, not the petrol engine smell or the fact that the gearbox and the clutch went for hundreds of thousands of miles before they needed replacing, but the fact that this, it just, it's just got that very kind of non-stressed interior. You know, some cars you get behind the wheel of and they egg you on. They've got that kind of performance vibe and they're like, hey, wouldn't you like to drive me fast? This car is, where would you like to go today? Yes. And driving over here, so I will always try and do a little bit of quick back roads to see how they behave. And I did a little stretch of quick back roads today. Actually, the same stretch that we're driving now in the other direction. A little bit more briskly. A I little bit it. more briskly. And yes, it absolutely did it. It did it with no complaints. It did it with a plum, even. It held the road really well. But did it feel like this was exactly what it wanted to be doing? No, it more felt like... I can do this, sure. If you, if this is what you would like to do, we can do this. But it more felt at home, at slightly lower speeds, a little bit more of a comfortable driving experience than trying to rapidly make time. And because of this car's <clears throat> quite large frontal area, not being rude, Volvo, this car has a drag coefficient of what, 0 0.3, which is the same as the Mini Cooper SE that we drove a couple of weeks back and it's not the most efficient at speed. Oh Lord, no. No, and let's be fair, this vehicle has a range of above 200 miles, about 223, I think. 220, I think, is the EPA approved range. Obviously, this is the all wheel drive variant. And by the way, I should point out, in Europe, this car is offered in two trim variants. Over here, it's just one. If you want a different trim variant, you have to go for the XC40, which is kind of the more crossover inspired twin to this car. This is the hatchback, so you don't get, you don't get as many trim choices. But should we tell everybody about the speed test that we did? I, I drove it up to you. Yes. And then on Saturday, we got a lot of surface water. It was torrential rain in, in places on the way up to you. Well, I left, the car had 200 miles. It actually said when I got in it, range is reduced due to temperature or something of that effect. I, I took a little video of it and it struggled to get to your other job 
with enough range for you to then drive back to your house at the end of your shift. And I ended up having to slow down mm -hmm. from the 70 mile an hour limit that was on the freeway. Yes. Yes, and driving down here today, again, it is, as you may have noticed, quite wet. And yeah, I think that because I didn't slow down, I did it all pretty much at 70, I arrived at a charger, and let's be realistic, I don't normally charge on longer range vehicles, we just drive them down and then do the driving for the day, and had to top up, which was at a disappointing 70 kilowatts, which also not great. Guesstimating off the range that I had, I would have got maybe 130, 140 miles of motorway range. Right. Which is not good. Is not good. Not given the size of this car's battery now. Not given the size and not given the price point at which it's sitting. Again, reminder, this car in the US is, is sitting at just shy of 60,000 US dollars. There are cheaper options available in other markets, just not here in North America. And on, for my part, when I drove the car up to your other, other job on Saturday, I think it was about 150 miles and then you did another 20 or 30 at the end of the day. It was fully charged when I left my house and you had driven your car, your e Nero, to your other job and then I basically pick up your other car and drive it down here so you've got a way of getting home at the end of the filming session. And you had had a power cut the night before. Yes. And when you got in your car, it hadn't been fully charged. No, it sat at 90%. And so I got back to mine with your car with 1% less on the gasometer than you did in this, having fully charged it. And your car has a, how big a battery? Uh, 64 kilowatts. As opposed to this, which I think is 70 something. Yeah, actually I think it might be 65 kilowatts usable and 66. Right, but it is disappointing, the range that you get out of this vehicle at speed, because to be honest, that's where I feel this feels most at home. I also like the fact that this car has fog lights. Yes. It's got front and rear fog lights, and we're in and out of the clouds here, so I'm going to turn it on briefly so you can see it on the dash here. But we are in the unenviable position in the world where I think we're one of the few countries where fog lights are not required, rear fog lights are not required. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we do get a lot of fog and low cloud in the winter, and it makes it very difficult on, on high-speed roads to see the car in front of you. This car has not only front fog lights, but rear fog lights too. You can just activate them here. I like that. We should, we should give them kudos for that. Oh, absolutely. Kudos to them for not cutting that out because most automakers do. We have a lot of blanking plates on the back of cars. The, the interior comfort of this, as we've talked about, it, it's, it's a pleasant space to be. I'm not entirely convinced about things like these air vents here or the the little swoosh here on top of the the glove box. Which is interesting because I, I mean, it's kind of, it's quite understated in this light level. Yes. And when I got it, when I saw photos of it, I thought, well, that looks very silly. And when I got in, I thought, well, it's actually pleasant. When I catch it in the right light, I like it. Like it, right now it looks great. And then I go into the dark and I'm like, oh, do I like it? Do I not like it? I think it certainly, it's distinctive, and I think it's not something that would turn most people off, particularly. And it, it definitely has a design accent, which the rest of this interior is pretty understated. The seats are, It is, yeah. Yeah. The seats are very simple, but yet comfortable. I find them extremely comfortable. Very comfortable. Uh, they, they have a decent amount of, of bolstering here for you to use. You can adjust the amount of leg support, which is a nice feature and that you do have lumbar support here for the for the driver. I'm not a fan of lumbar support. It always ends up giving me a bad back, but it's there if you want it. The heated seats are excellent. In fact, when I was driving this car up to you and I was starting to get a little bit of range anxiety, it's the first time I've had range anxiety in a press car for a long time. I turned off the heating, which is a heat pump, we think, in this version. And I just relied on the, the heated seats and the steering wheel to keep me warm, and it worked just fine. 
the rear seats are okay too? Yes, yes, the rear seats are very comfortable, even if I did accidentally trap myself in the car yet earlier today. I do like the level of sound deadening in this. This is a very Volvo thing, it's very good sound deadening. It is an extremely quiet car. And that does remind me of Volvos all the way back. And, you know, blue carpet aside, which I did have in my 240. Indeed. And I think it's probably the same blue as well. It feels like they haven't changed the blue <laughs> in all the time they've been building cars. And I'm not saying that's a mistake. No. I'm just saying that seems to be the case. And, you know, there are some, some great things here in terms of the cabin. Everything is within easy reach as a driver. Being a Volvo, everything is sa about safety, right? Airbags everywhere, great pretensioner seatbelt system, blind spot information, uh, which in this car you really need because this is the hatchback version of the XC40. Effectively, the, the C40 is like the XC40, but with a hatchback instead of a, a kind of a more SUV wagony end. You've got more of a blind spot in this version. Yeah, you do have a massive blind spot, but the blind spot detection system works really well. And the signal that there is something in the blind spot is really clear and very obvious. And it's kind of not, it's in your peripheral vision as well. The vision out the front is very good. There's not a huge bonnet for you to kind of miss things under. And because that steering is so very direct, find it very easy to figure out where everything is and a road like this especially with one pedal driving is most excellent and we should we should obviously note that the one pedal driving is very good you can turn it on as an optional extra and it works when the battery is full yes yeah it which works is un from unusual which is very good um, and I will say it is very very on point with when it brings the car to a stop it's not like some systems There's no feel, yeah, yeah, some systems feel quite vague about whether they're going to slow down or not. This doesn't give you any of that kind of ambiguity. This center touchscreen display is very responsive and very good. As you mentioned, it's Android Automotive, not Android Auto, which gives it plenty of upgradability in the future through over-the-air software updates. And that's a, a bonus point for, for Volvo. But some of the integration of this, I don't like. Things feel several buttons away. I don't know if that's how you felt. It does have the buttons for the heated rear screen and mirrors and the front demist on discrete separate buttons which is good but the thing that I end up fiddling the most with which is temperature and seat heaters and things like that those are on the screen and I'm still not sold on that it means that I have to go in there and dink with things when I should be driving when the voice system is working I believe you can turn them on but like I said something went wrong on Saturday when I was driving it up to you and so my big chance to put the car through its tests was was basically me going this is frozen and I can't get it to do anything. Yeah that's definitely unfortunate. I have tried it and it does work pretty well with the voice system. It's set various things. I've asked it to dim the cabin lights and it worked and I think in general as long as the voice system is working for you then Android Automotive is fine. I think that like a lot of Google operating system projects, it will get better and it will get very good eventually, but it's still somewhat early days for Android Automotive and I think it still needs a little bit more polish and a little bit more finesse. It still feels more like a computer science project than it does a really, really polished system. That said, I would still advocate for something like Android Automotive over a standard previous generation infotainment system because of that upgradability. We're seeing every automaker go towards that and I think if you are looking to spend a large amount of money on an electric vehicle in the future, knowing if that is a function that is available in your car is going to be very important. One of the things I always ask myself when I when I get behind the wheel of a press car is 
Would I be comfortable driving this long distance? Could I road trip this car? From an interior comfort point of view, the answer is yes, I could road trip this car and be very comfortable and happy about it. From a practicality point of view, when you add in the fact that it only has a real world two to 220 miles range between stops, which if you are rapid charging to 80%, reduces that to maybe 160, 170, 180, depending on the types of roads that you're driving. It feels like this doesn't quite have the long legs you'd need to drive it long distance. The other thing that you wanted to bring up is that while it does have plenty of technology to try and keep you on the straight and narrow, this is probably the worst lane keep assist system I've ever driven. Yes. And I, I think if I'm being generous, if you turn off pilot assist, which we'll talk about in a second, the bare lane keep assist is not bad most of the time. In the dry, it's okay. It generally detects lane lines and it will nudge you back into the lane most of the time. It's pretty good at keeping distance from the vehicle in front. That, that it is, yep, the uh, radar assistance. And it reacts very well to changes in, in lead vehicle speed and direction. Yes, most. I will say it's not the worst. I'm going to revise my statement. It is not the worst lane keep assist system I've ever used. That honor goes to the first generation Chevrolet Bolt Premier, whose lane keep assist function is more a case of you're, you're pointing in the right direction, keep going. To be fair, that's actually better than this managed on my journey home from work. It is the first vehicle I've had. I've joked that most autonomous or semi-autonomous systems will attempt to kill you occasionally. It is the first one I've had that really had a good go. I mean, yes. usually when I say it's going to try and kill you, I mean it's not going to notice a car merging in or it's not going to notice that it's trying to take an exit instead of following the road that you're on. Maybe it might not manage for the comma. It will tell you that it's not going to make a curve because it can't produce enough torque through the steering. This one, this one actually tried to steer me off the road yes. at speed in the rain which I did not find soothing. And disclaimer, you know, automakers very often say do not use these systems in the rain. And I know someone in the comments is gonna go, you shouldn't be using it in that, in that condition. But the reality is that a lot of people, if you turn it on at the start of a journey and it starts raining, you're gonna keep it on. I had the car decide it was gonna to head towards a crash barrier. Yes, I can believe that. It, it, it did that. The road widened for an off-ramp and it was like, I, I'm just gonna pick the middle. And the middle between the off-ramp and the freeway was a crash barrier. Just expand a little on what, what it did for me. I was driving down a highway with a, a center division and I was in the right lane and driving on a fairly clear road. There wasn't really very much traffic and the car suddenly lurched right across the fog line, halfway into the shoulder as I kind of, and I had my hand on the wheel, but I wasn't expecting to have a sudden change in direction at 70 miles an hour. Right, which is one of the reasons, by the way, that Comma has a limit on its torque steering, so that your car doesn't do that. And it is, it was a proper brown adrenaline moment <laughs> where I thought that I was going to total a press car. But we should not forget, this is a Scandinavian car brand. Okay, owned by a Chinese company now, but they should be used to making cars that perform really well in terrible weather. The car is so well sure-footed in inclement weather. It has the fog lights, but the driver assistance system is really not very assistive. No, and again, this is something that may get improved with over-the-air updates. Might get better. I'm hoping it does. But at the moment, it is one of the really significant shortfalls for me on this vehicle. It's not something that would prevent me from buying the car, but definitely something that I would say, well, that's not really a feature I would count as being worth mentioning. Kate, I brought you back to mine. Cheers. And I made Cheers. Kate a proper coffee. 
So, Volvo C40 recharge. I think it's a car that's 90% there. It's 90% there, but it's another demonstration as to why we should never have electric vehicles built on shared platforms. Yes. It, it, the compromises that it has all derive from the fact that there is space in the vehicle for an internal combustion engine and potentially a hybrid battery pack. And it, it's so close. It's so it close. It is so close. And I know that it sounds hypocritical and some, some will be keyboard worrying in the comments going, but you own and drive a vehicle that is on a shared platform. And yes, the, the F-150 Lightning is built on the original F-150, but the chassis is separate. So they designed a separate setup for a pickup truck and then put the original top on top. And the difference is that when you're building a pickup, there's room underneath for batteries. And they could say the same thing about me because I drive a Kia Niro, which is built on a multi-fuel platform. And the critiques I have of that vehicle are the same kind of critiques I have of this for the most part. I think if the C40 recharge had a better efficiency or a larger battery pack, and I'm going to say efficiency is more preferable mm -hmm. because 75 kilowatt hours and it only does 200 miles in real world range. That's not great for a mid-sized vehicle. I mean, let's be fair. This is a car that is fabulous. It's really delightful in town. It absolutely is. It's a breeze to park. It's got great light steering. If you just flip the, the steering over to the light setting, I would love it to automatically switch at low speeds. That would be awesome. Yeah. You know, high, nice, firm feel on the on the motorway. And then around town, super, you know, finger light, mm -hmm. which are the two steering modes. It's such a funny thing because if it went a bit further, it would be so good for road tripping. It is so comfortable and so quiet. And, and I feel like I need to be fair here to Volvo. We are filming this two days before the XC90 is revealed. Mm -hmm. Two days. So by the time this gets edited and the time it gets published, we'll know what the XE90 is going to bring to the table. We know it's going to be a high-end eighty plus thousand dollar car. I, I don't think it's going to sell for less than eighty five. No. It's going to have a bigger battery pack. We know that. It's going to have a longer range. It's designed as a longer range vehicle. It's a larger vehicle. It's an SUV. It's going to be far more popular. I think though that the proposition for the C forty in North America is different to the C forty in Europe, and I think we would be really not being fair to Volvo or indeed fair to our audience no. if we didn't acknowledge that in Europe this is going to be a cracking car. Yes, it absolutely is. And actually on the East Coast. If you are going to be making long distance cross country trips, this is not going to work for you in North America because of that slower charge time that we've seen. That might change in the summer. And just not enough efficiency to be usable. If it was 250, then you would have an 80% charge of 200 miles yeah. comfortably. Yeah. But 80% of 200, mm -hmm. that's going to be pushing the boundary between charging stops in an area where the network is having problems. What is our conclusion? It's a great car. We love it. But we can't recommend it for America because its range is a bit rubbish. I think we can't recommend it for anyone who needs it for long distance in America. I mean, if you only occasionally do like 200 miles and you have charging stations around, you have an area where you have fairly good charging provision, fine. Uh, but the, <clears throat> the interior comfort is awesome. I would struggle to recommend this as an alternative to a Model Y though. Yeah, I can I can see that. Because Model Y has supercharger network. And I know everyone's like, that's the sound. That sound there is the sound of people's jaws hitting the floor because I'm basically saying a Model I is going to be better than a better choice. But when you look at the price, mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty close in price. Yeah. 
In fact, the Model Y could be, I think, purchased slightly more cheaply. But I'm going to say, same thing we said for the Polestar. Mm. Or that you and Winter said for the Polestar. Yeah. Which is the next car that they build, in particularly in this class, is going to be amazing. Yeah, because we know that, that Volvo is going to have access to lithium-ion phosphate batteries. Mm-hmm which are going to have a longer battery life. And be cheaper. A lot cheaper. cheaper. They're not going to have the same energy density, though. No. But, but that can maybe be overcome with a redesign of the front end to make it more aerodynamic. And also, remember, the CMA platform is 10 years old. Yes, it is. I remember when that came out. In fact, the last all-electric Volvo that I drove before this mm -hmm. was the C30 electric Yeah. in 2012 in Karuna in Sweden and I still have a very big fondness for Volvo because unlike a lot of automakers who are all about bragging what their cars can do Volvo is more interested in showing you and I think that car really does show you what it's capable of doing and it doesn't seem to promise anything that it's not going to do mm. except maybe the lane assist thing yeah, we, we'll, we'll maybe not talk about that. I think we've harped on about that in the conversation, but yeah, no, no. That is it for today. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There are links in the video description. And if you liked this video, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you do send goes towards helping us make great content and keeping this place nice, cozy and warm. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to be told when our next video goes live. And before I go, do check out our regular sponsors, links below. And if you use any of our regular sponsors and use those relevant codes, which are also listed below, you'll be helping us too. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the Charged Up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing. We currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tesla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Ascenter, and Jim Burness. And of course, out of this world thanks to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Dropnack, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and... Mm. Ian. Ian! Excellent! Ian! If you want to be part of that amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button to support us on YouTube, or you can show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. There are links below. And if you are unable to support us financially, I know that the economy is not great right now around the world. Know that just watching the video and sharing it really does make a massive difference to how well our videos perform. Before I go, because I know someone will ask, this is a painting of Denali in Alaska. It was made by a dear friend of the family, Rebecca Gelbert, and it is beautiful. So shout out to her. I'll try and link to her art site below. Thanks for joining us. And as always, keep, keep evolving. evolving.